28. Just over three weeks, this is what God, I hear it in my spirit. I hear it when I get up. I hear it when I go to bed. I hear it when I come to church. And maybe you've heard it from my lips the last three weeks when I minister to people. I just keep hearing fresh oil and new wine. Fresh oil and new wine. Fresh oil and new wine. It's like it's reverberating through my whole being. When I wake up at night, I hear fresh oil and new wine. Fresh oil and new wine. <laughs> and this afternoon, or actually yesterday afternoon, I said, maybe, I sh maybe God is trying to say something, you know. Maybe we should speak it in the air. Fresh oil and new wine. Maybe we should prophesy it. Maybe we should pray for it. Maybe we should speak it over one another. Fresh oil and new wine. Fresh oil and new wine. Amen. And all the people that's running around, that's ushers and that has an IQ above 45, would they close the doors for us, please? Thank you. Isaiah 28. This is where we're going to start tonight. Verse 9. Are you ready? Okay, now remember, remember, this, this ministry is known for the teachings of grace. I think the teaching of grace has changed more preachers' lives than any other teaching that I know. If I must think of letters of thanksgiving that I get from preachers all across the world, say, since I heard the message of grace, my whole ministry has changed. Since I started teaching the people the grace of God, everything has changed. And yet, in the midst of all the grace and mercy, there's people that still stick to Moses. God already said to Joshua, Moses is dead. Okay, so, but you know, after all these years, people still stick to Moses. You know, when Jesus came to this earth as, as, as a human being, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees kept on saying, the law of Moses, the law of Moses. And Jesus kept on saying, but I say. Amen. But, I, but the law of Moses says, but I say. But the law of Moses. And yet, you know, we read the book of Romans, we book, read the book of Galatians, we read the book of Hebrews. Those are three books you've got to read together yeah. and find out, and especially put Colossians with it, you know, it's chapter 2. It says, how come after everything that Christ has done for you, why do you want to go back to the law? Yeah. Hmm? I mean, the law, nobody could keep it. And the law only brings judgment and condemnation. Jesus came to liberate you and set you free. Jesus came to bring you life. Jesus didn't come to bring you a set of rules. Moses gave them a set of rules. Jesus came and gave us life. No, not a set of rules, not a, you know. Now, listen to this. And this will shock a few people that call themselves prophets. Uh, 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 I, I don't know what school this is. But you know, prophets would come and they would say, Brother, would you stand? I want to prophesy of you. Oh, the Lord would say, My son, it'll be precept upon precept, line upon line. And thus say the Lord, precept upon precept, line. I said, What trash is this guy prophesying? Maybe you've heard it too. Especially if they come from, you know, where the stars and the stripes are. You know, they love to prophesy. Precepts upon precepts and line upon line. I don't know what prophetic school it is that teaches this, but listen to the word tonight. Listen to the word of the Lord. Isaiah 28. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Just listen to this. Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, my dear beloved, when I wrote to you, I could not write to you as unto mature. I had to write unto you as infants, as mere babies in Christ, because you are not able to take solid food. You are still there that you need to be fed with milk. Yet to the same church, he said, said you stand behind in no spiritual gift. You know, but yet to the spiritual gifted church, he said, you are just a bunch of babies and it's time to get matured. In Hebrews chapter 5, the same writer says, by the time you all need to be teachers, 
But because of what you are going through, you need to be fed with milk again because you are not ready to take solid and mature food. And, and here he comes and says, God is ready to teach knowledge and doctrine to people, but you've got to get away from the milk. You've got to get away from baby doctrines, you know, and uh, somebody's got to get it here. Galatians chapter 4 says, if the heir, though he is heir of the whole estate, as long as he is a baby, a child, he differs nothing from a slave. But he is under tutors and governors till the time appointed of the father. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those that were under the law, that we can receive the adoption of sons. And because we are sons, God has put the spirit of his son in us, crying, Abba, Father. And therefore we are no longer children. Okay? So, uh, God is ready to teach advanced doctrine. God is ready to teach mature doctrine. God is ready to bring solid food. He said, but it's only for those that are weaned from the milk and the breast. Okay, let's read on. Verse 10. For precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Look at this. I'm going to read it to you now, the rest, and you're going to be shocked. God says, I want to teach doctrine to mature people that are ready to receive some solid food from my lips. Yeah. He says, but it will only be for those who are not children. Then he says, you know what the children are like? It's precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Because if you go to Galatians, you know who he calls the children? The people that sticks to the law. Galatians 3 verse 1. Oh, you senseless, stupid, idiotic, unreflecting, silly Galatians. Who has bewitched you? You got the gospel. It was like Christ was portrayed as crucified amongst you. Now you want to go back to the law. Did you receive the spirit because you obeyed the law or because of the message of faith? And then he goes on to chapter 4. He says, even if you heir of all things, as long as you stay a child... You differ nothing from a slave. So the children are the law people or the people that doesn't take the message of grace. For if you don't embrace grace, it means you're clinging to the law. If you totally embrace grace, you've got to let go of Moses and you've got to go for Christ. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, freedom. Mm. Let's go on, verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue would he speak to this people. Now, you can pick that up in 1 Corinthians 14 where Paul is talking about speaking in other tongues or in new tongues and he says in verse 18, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. In verse 2 he says, if I speak in tongues, my spirit speak mysteries to God. Yeah. Verse 4 he says, if I speak in tongues, you know, I edify myself. Yeah. And verse 14 he says, how is it then I will pray in the spirit but also with the understanding. You know, I'll sing in the spirit and also with the understanding. Then he goes on to say, well, well did the Bible say with stammering lips and the stuff tongue will I speak to this people. So Paul is referring to this very scripture when he tries to explain the power of speaking in other tongues. Are you with me? Okay. Verse 12. To whom he said, this is the rest, wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet you would not hear. Okay, now we did read that 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4 says, If I speak in an unknown tongue, I edify myself. I refresh myself. I quicken myself. Okay, but here he says, But the word of the Lord, which word? The word that says you can speak in other tongues. Okay, remember this is what Paul referred to. He says, This word was to them. Precept upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, and that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, he is scornful men. So the Bible says, even when the truth of the Spirit came to the house of Israel or to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they 
Whatever they received, they just got law from it. They never heard the spiritual truth. That's why Paul had to write, did you get this stuff because you obeyed the law or because of the message of faith? He says, if you want to stick to the message of faith, you've got to go for the spiritual stuff. So I want to be spiritual. Spiritual things must be compared to spiritual things. The natural man received not the things of the Spirit of God. They are spiritually discerned. Verse 21. Verse 21. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perisim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work. Okay, that, that Mount Perisim talks about how the Lord broke through. The Lord broke through for David, okay? So this is talking about the Lord of the breakthrough. So God will break through for you so that he can do his work. Listen to this. His strange work. And bring to pass his act. His strange work. Act. Chapter 29. Are you ready for a word of the Lord tonight? Yes. Say fresh oil, fresh oil and new wine. Man, it's going to be cool. I can't wait to try out that new laptop of mine. Man, it's gonna be fresh oil and new wine. So the word of the Lord comes and says, this is how I want to refresh you. I want to speak through you, to you, and amongst you in new tongues. He calls it there uh, stammering lips and a stuttering tongue. Is that all right? You got it there? He says, but they would not. They stuck to the law. I mean, that's why I don't mind. In any case, so... What did we read? Okay, so God says, he will rise up. God will rise up to bring you your breakthrough. Is that right? He says, but if you want to have that spiritual breakthrough, I want to put it there tonight. If you want to have that spiritual breakthrough, we'll start easy tonight. If you want to have that spiritual breakthrough, you must understand Okay, you see that's why many people don't receive the things that God does in the church. They pray. They pray faithfully for 40 years. Oh, send your spirit. God, give us revival in our church. And they're so faithful. And all of a sudden, God turns up. And people start falling out of the chairs and they laugh. And they say, oh, what's this evil in our church? And God says, you've been praying for me to show up. I help you? We're going to refer to this scripture a couple of times tonight, I hope. But 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 still states, As is written, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it come upon the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Amen. Dropping three verses down, the natural man will not receive the things of the Spirit. It can only be spiritually discerned. So if you want to, with a natural mind, come and sit here tonight and say, I'm going to check this guy out. You know what you are? Yo. <laughs> he said it. You're a sucker. <laughs> How can you check me out with a natural eye? I'm not natural. I mean, those miracles... Doctors can't take those crutches away in the natural. Medicine can't take the crutches away. Traction in hospital can't take the crutches away. Hypnotism can't take the crutches away. Spiritism can't take the crutches away. Buddhism can't take the crutches away. They need something spiritual to release people from bondage and sickness. Hmm? Now people want to check out the church. I want to check out if this is real.
Did you know that nobody that speaks in tongues has ever questioned tongues? <laughs> Did you know that a rich man has never queried money? Did you know the person got healed never questioned miracles? Did you know that a person that has a car doesn't really fight about bicycles? It was like this meeting that we ha heard the testimony of years ago when we went to Dr. Morris Arello's School of Ministry in 1985. He told the story of how an atheist barged into his meetings and he had the habit of eating oranges while he preached. Like, like rugby, you know, eating oranges while he... Okay, thank you. It's very exciting. And this guy barged onto the stage and he said, Preacher, God is not a reality. I'm an atheist. How can you mislead all these people? He said, I challenge you on who God is. So he just walked over to the side where the table was with the oranges and, you know, he ate it. And this guy said, See, He's turning his back on me. He can't even take a challenge. I'm an atheist. I challenge this man on. So he took another orange. He turned around to the guy that's now, you know. He said, tell me, sir, this orange, is it sweet or is it sour? The guy said, how do I know? I didn't eat it. You ate it. He said, true. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. How can you talk about God if you haven't tried Him? How can you argue tongues if you never spoke in tongues? How can you argue a miracle if you never experienced a miracle? But brother, fight the stuff of God and get sick. Then you say, boss, I would put three seekers, right? Are we going to chapter 29? Verse 10. For... Now, you, you will hear the Scriptures as I read it. You will hear it screaming from the New Testament, especially in the book of Romans. For the Lord has poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. The Lord has closed your eyes. Your prophets and your rulers, your seers, hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed which men deliver unto one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray you. And he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to them that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray you. And he said, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord saith, For as much as this people draw near with me, with their mouth and with their lips do they honor me, but they have removed their heart far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precept of men. Precept upon precept, line upon line. Now, how many knows everything I just read now is quoted by Jesus and is quoted by Paul? Jesus stands up in Matthew 15. He says, these people come near to me with their mouths, but their hearts are far removed. In vain do they worship me, coming with doctrines of men. Mark chapter 3, he says, you make the word of God powerless. You make it of no effect because you keep on clinging to the precepts of men. It's time to get into the spirit of God and realize God is not a law. God is a spirit. Hmm? God is not a set of rules. God is liberty. God is life. Let's just read on. He says, and these people, because they clung to the law of precept upon precept, all the visions of this book, just look at me, all the visions of this book has become a sealed book. God says even their own prophets, even their own seers, when you go to their prophets and say, tell us, they say, ah, it's sealed. I'll show you their prophets are still in the church because they come and say it's sealed. Especially when they refer to the book of Revelation. They say, oh, the day will come when the seals will be broken and seven horses will jump out. 
as long as this word is precept upon precept, line upon line, and you have not received the Spirit of God, God says the visions will be a sealed book. God says the prophets will have a sealed book. You will go to the most learned prophets and say, can you read this to me? They say, we can't read it. It's a sealed book. Okay, we'll get to it in a minute from now. Verse 14, therefore behold. Where are we? 13, excuse me. Wherefore the Lord says for us, oh no, 14, excuse me. Therefore behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work. Remember the strange work? Amongst the people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of the wise men shall perish. And the understanding of the prudent men shall be hidden. Where did you see that in the New Testament? In 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, where Paul says, where is the wise man of this age? Where is the prudent? He says, but we come with the wisdom that are not taught by human intellect. And then he goes on, as it is written, I have not seen, ear hath not heard. So Paul says, there's marvelous stuff, there's wonderful stuff, there's strange stuff that's going to happen for the people that's going to not listen to the wisdom of the people that teach us by by the law of Moses and try to put us in a sealed book but the people that realize Jesus came to bring revelation of his word hmm? verse 18 in that day shall the deaf hear the words of this book the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among them shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Now that you can read the whole thing in Isaiah 35 and in Hebrews chapter 12, where Paul refers to Isaiah 35. He says, in that day shall the blind see, the lame shall jump up, and there's going to be great stuff happening when we stand up and make our weak knees and our tottered hands strong in the Lord and realize we are a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. We are the light of the world. In that day, we're going to see stuff that we've never seen before. So today, God is about to do strange things, wonderful things. Marvelous things. Strange, wonderful, marvelous things is God about to do. But God says, unfortunately, when this prophecy went out, it's like a sealed book because people stick to the law of Moses. I don't know about you, but I'd rather have the revelations and the visions come to me than stick to a sealed book. Hmm? So let's go to the sealed book in Daniel 9. Are you ready? Yes. So we jump a little bit deeper. Yes. And then we're going to jump very deep. Yes. And then we're just going to float down our backs. Okay. You know where Daniel is? Not in the lion's den anymore, okay? <laughs> Daniel 9. Daniel 9. Annalisa's food, she can teach you deeper on this. I'm just going to touch on the surface thing here. Verse 24. I'll just throw it in to get to another portion of scripture to, to try and ask you, are we teaching people law or are we teaching them the spirit of God? Are we teaching them the word by the spirit or are we trying to bind them back to Israel? Are we trying to bring them back to a geographical place, to the seat of Moses, or do we want to take them to the throne of heaven and the mercy seat of Christ? Where are we taking people to? Now, you can make up your own mind. I will not teach doctrine, but you, you see it in the lines. In the Seventy weeks are determined upon your people. Whose people? Daniel's people. Who are they? Jews. And upon your holy city. Which was the holy city? Jerusalem. To f listen to this. 
70 weeks will come to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build up Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince, it's the same person, Thank you. He calls Messiah the prince. Shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, which is seven days. And in the midst of the week, which is three and a half days, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation, which is Jewish rituals, to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation and determined, and the, that determined shall be poured upon, that which is determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Go to chapter 12. You are ready for some fresh oil and new wine. Daniel says, from the time of captivity, 70 weeks. Okay? He says, and at the end of the 70 weeks, there will be seven weeks and there will be a week. Okay? 70 weeks, end up with seven weeks, end up with another week. See, this is happen. This will all reach their consummation when Messiah comes, which is Christ. Is that true? When will it end? When Messiah comes. Did your Bible say that? Not, not when Bush or Mandela comes. Not when Mugabe comes. Okay, thank you for the excitement in the house. The Bible says it'll be there until Messiah comes. Did it say so? He says, and the end of the last week will, will be like this. The end of the last week of the 70 weeks, of the seventh week of the 70 weeks will end like this. In the middle of this week, Christ, the Messiah, will be cut off. So Jesus ministered three and a half years, and then there was another three and a half years left of the 70 weeks. So what happened at the end of that three and a half years? The op Jewish ablution stopped. How did it stop? By Stephen being martyred. And when the last stone fell on Stephen, they turned their backs on the Jews and they started preaching to the Gentiles. 70 weeks fulfilled. Okay, don't go too deep in that. Annalise can teach you later. I just want to bring you a truth out here. Okay? Listen to this. He says, Daniel, all this beautiful stuff that I'm talking to you about, seal it. All these visions, let it be sealed. Okay? Chapter 12. What visions? Of how everything will reach their consummation when Messiah is cut off. In other words, when Jesus dies, this will be the fullness of time. This will be the end of a lot of stuff. Uh, 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 Hebrews chapter 9 says, in the end of the world. Yeah, yeah. Talking about when Christ died talking about a body that was prepared. In the end of the world, yeah. he calls it, not the end of the world, the end of that religious Moses yeah. law, yeah. ritual, yeah. line upon line, precept upon precept, Pharisee, Sadducee, offering sacrifices, bringing lambs into the temple. The end of that world will be when Christ is offered. He said, it'll be the end of sacrifice. Yeah. 
Did he say so? The most holy will be anointed. Jesus opened it up and said, we can now boldly come. Everything happened when Christ was crucified. Okay, you did read it. Chapter 12. Hmm? Okay, I forgot to say. He says, the end of the 70 week will reach its fullness in this. It will be the end of sin. And it will be the beginning of righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things become new. Verse 21, God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us so that we can be made the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. Zechariah chapter 13, in that day, remember Daniel, in that day, that day, Zechariah 13, in that day, a fountain shall be opened against sin. Now, I want to ask anybody, before you go to the end time teachings of the Jews, Israel, Jerusalem, rapture type of stuff, just keep this in mind. Did Jesus came to make an end to sin? Did Jesus come to finish the law? Did Jesus say it is finished, or did he say it will be finished? Did Jesus take the sin of the world? Or did he say, one day I will take? If he took the sin of the world, if the crucified Christ is then the place where Jesus cried out, it is finished. If it is true that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastisement of our peace was upon him, with his stripes we are. If that is true, why do we postpone the prophecy for some end time ruler to stand up called Antichrist or beast or prophet if it says in Messiah's day this will be fulfilled? He says this is the key. It will be the end of sin and it will be the beginning of everlasting righteousness. Did Jesus pay a price or didn't he? Right. Thank you. Fountain be opened against sin. Chapter 12, turn in, verse 2, oh goodness, I never thought I'm going to touch on this tonight, but Marcus, since you brought your son, let's do it, and many of them, verse 2, that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, stop. is he talking about? I'll tell you what he's talking about. Isaiah 52, which talks about Jesus being marred more than any man, crucified, and then chapter 53, going on to who shall believe our report, chapter 52 says, arise, awake, and shake yourself loose from the dust. He says, because he was marred more than any man. So he says, when Christ is crucified, there's going to be awakening to people that are sitting in the dust. Okay. Now can I take you, who, who, who is in the dust? Sand. What is sand? It's the natural seed of Abraham. But the stars of heaven is the spiritual seed of Abraham. So Israel was called stars of heaven, Deuteronomy chapter 9. But Deuteronomy 28, he says, but if Israel do not receive my word, they shall all become sand of the seashore. Okay, just to help you write. But God still says my spiritual people are stars of heaven. So 1 Corinthians 2, as I have not seen, ear not heard, neither has come up in the heart of man, the things that God has prepared. But this stuff must be spiritually discerned. The natural man will not receive it. So, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 says, Of well it is said that Israel is natural. Chapter 9, verse 27, All Israel is now sand of the sea. He says, but as the natural branches were ripped off so that you can be crafted in to the olive tree, which talks about the oil of the anointing, and become spiritual, don't boast against the natural because God has power to craft them in again, and so shall all Israel be saved. 
God never said all Israel is going to be saved. He said, if they allow to be crafted in, so shall all Israel be saved. So shall all KwaZulu-Natal be saved. So shall all Switzerland be saved. So shall all Germany be saved. So shall all South Africa be saved. So shall all United States of America be saved. Everybody that's not crafted in are natural dust of the sea, sand of the sea. So God says, all the people that throughout the ages had no part of the commonwealth of Israel, Colossians and Philippians, they were outsiders. They were not part of the covenants of God. God says they were outside. But that, that day, that day when Messiah is crucified, the people in the dust are going to wake. Awake out of the dust. Arise and sit in a dignified place. Isaiah 52, Isaiah 60, arise, shine. Who shines? The sun. What is the sun? Stars. Thank you. Verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal this book. Even to the time of the end. Just wake up. Sinners will now be saved. The unrighteous shall be made righteous. Messiah, let's put it in today's words Christ will die. That day. Okay? Did Jesus die? Can sinners now be saved? Can the unrighteous now be righteous? Hello, Peter. Okay, so it means it means he just came back from Pretoria. It means. If, but it means Peter is here. It means, listen, if, if that is what was sealed, okay, if that is what was sealed, okay, I, I'm just bringing you the context. Wake up out of the doctrines that people try to push down your throat. Daniel says, this is what I have to seal. That all people that are not part of Israel can all of a sudden be saved. The unrighteous can be made righteous. The day when Messiah dies on the cross, he says, Daniel, seal this. Because we are in Babylonian captivity. If the Jews must find out they're going to go back to Israel, rebuild the temple for nothing. Because when 70 weeks are fulfilled... It's going to be an end of sacrifices. It's going to be an end of Jewish ablutions. I'm going to turn and say it's finished, and the Holy of Holies will be anointed. Sinners can be saved. Oh, unrighteous can be made righteous. If they knew it then, they would have crucified Daniel and not Jesus. This is not deep, people. What have you heard about the sealed book? What have you heard about Daniel's 70 weeks? Now tonight he says this whole thing reaches consummation when Messiah is cut off. He calls it that day. In that day, he says, Zechariah, a fountain will be opened against him. There is a fountain filled with blood to high, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Okay. look at the passion of the Christ. We go look at Mel Gibson's movie about the passion of the Christ. We hang a picture of the crucified Christ in our house. 
We tell the children how Jesus died for them. We sing about at the cross, at the cross. Where, but we keep it sealed when it comes to the revelation. Daniel, shut, seal, shut, shut it up, seal it till the end. Till what end? The end of the 70 weeks. When was the end? He said, oh, when Messiah was cut off. It's there. You don't have to look for it. It's just there. He says, but their prophets will not see it because they still have precept upon precept, line upon line. So what would people teach you? People, if we go to the Jewish rabbis and we read out of their doctrines and we, no, 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 we got nothing to do with Jewish rabbis and their doctrines. He said, when that day comes, it'll be the end of the ablutions, which means Jewish teachings. Don't get fed up. You could hear that religious demon enter. Did you feel, did you feel, did you feel that silence coming into the house? Maybe it's not here. Maybe it's on television. Let me help you. Do you know what Jewish doctrines are? Do yourself a favor. I will not talk about it. There's a big Jewish bookshop in Johannesburg, and there's a very big one in Cape Town. Just, I'm in South Africa, so I'm talking for South Africa. Would you do yourself a favor and go to a Jewish bookshop and take any Jewish teachings from the bookshelves and read it? You will read about the power and how to read the tarot card. You will read about how to play the Huji board, Jewish doctrines. You will play how to cast witchcraft spells on people, Jewish doctrines endorsed by King Solomon out of his temple. You can read about Freemasonry, Jewish doctrines. Don't be shocked, this is Jewish doctrines. You can read about the Kabbalah and how to read the stars. Written, everything I quoted now, I'm saying it right on television. Everything I said now is books written by Jewish rabbis. I'm not ugly. I'm just saying on the air, you don't have to believe me. I challenge you that will go back and listen to the guys on TV that sits with the rabbis and tell to teach you about the end of times and when the 70 weeks are fulfilled. According to this book, it happened when Christ died. So why can't people see it? Because they mix the Jewish thing, the Israel thing with the church thing. The two have no fellowship one with another. Galatians 4 says, cast out the bond woman. And he calls her present Jerusalem. The church is a worldwide thing. It's not a Middle East thing. God help the television channels. I never see the cross on them. I see a Jewish flag now on all the Christian TV stations. Instead of a crucified Christ, we have a Jewish flag. Can I help you further? That Star of David was only invented 300 AD by a Jewish rabbi who didn't believe in Jesus Christ and who was believing in witchcraft. Where do you find that? In the Jewish bookshop. That's not the star of David on that flag. It was only invented 300 something AD. Sorry, people. Don't believe a myth. Sorry if I have to say this stuff on TV. I haven't got a lot of support right now. But I tell you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I want to talk to you about the opening of the sealed book which happened 2,000 years ago, that we can get freedom from sin, freedom from sickness, freedom from unrighteousness, freedom from bondage, freedom from condemnation. If you want to keep the revival, get away from the law. I just prophesied. Yeah, come out of her. Don't be part of this revelation. Right, Revelation 5 and 6.
ok. Okay, we must just keep this tape where I said I prophesied you. Just keep this DVD very secure. If you want to keep the revival, don't promote it to the Middle East. Promote it to the cross of Christ. Promote it to the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus. Don't promote it towards a Jewish doctrine. Promote it to the resurrected, risen, crucified, eternal King of glory. Give Jesus Christ the glory. I'm serious. I'm not ugly. I'm standing here speaking as a prophet. Let's check the prophet's words. Hmm? Now the people that were supposed to be New Testament prophets are now prophesying from Jerusalem. Advertised on TV channels, come listen to the greatest prophets now prophesying. You know, hey, prophesy from Christ Jesus. Prophesy from the Spirit. I'm ready to face any person. Right, not by my own power and might on, on this ground of the scripture. But this is not the teaching. So if you didn't believe anything I said to now, if you disagree, stop it. Let's go back to fresh oil and new wine. But this all is going to take us there. Sorry, God has called me to be a true prophet. And I never say this in public, but to point the way and say, hey, people, we're deviating from truth. Can we get back to the word? Can we get back to the word? Don't get, don't get your advice from a rabbi. Get it from the Holy Spirit. The rabbi don't believe in Jesus. How can he teach you the word? They didn't believe it there. How would they believe it now? Sorry, somebody's got to say it. Thank you. The support is great. I'm not sarcastic. I believe the support is great. The Spirit Word Revival is going to super excel anything because of the Word. Okay. Now, before we read Revelation 5 and 6, you've got to remember, in the beginning was the Word. You've got to remember, this Word was with God, and this Word was God, and nothing was made that was not made by Him, and everything that was made was made by Him, and in Him everything exists. We've got to remember, this Word became flesh. John 1 verse 14. And dwelled amongst us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. We got to remember this. Huh? We got to remember. Shall I say it? I shall say it. In, in John chapter 6, Jesus is busy with the multitudes for three days. After three days, they realize well, these people hasn't eaten. If you think I'm preaching long, Jesus did it three days. <laughs> then he realized the people got hungry and he had to feed them with a miracle. <laughs> Just after he multiplied the bread, the people started looking for him. Jesus said, you know why you're looking for me? Not because you saw the miracle, but because you ate and were satisfied. Why don't you just seek me for the bread that will last forever? And they, and they give him a counter thing. They say, Moses gave us bread in the wilderness. Jesus turns around and said, Moses did not give you bread, manna. Moses did not give you bread, manna. Moses did not give you bread. But my father gives you the true bread. They say, what is this true bread? He said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. And they say, no, 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 you can't tell us this stuff. And you, are you bigger than Moses and stuff like this? And Jesus said, if you could only seek me because of the miracles. John chapter 6, verse 26, 27. 27 says, and this is the true bread because God has sealed him with his Holy Spirit. And they said, what must we then do to do the works of God? He said, believe in Him. Amen. Believe on who? Who? He whom God has sealed with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, there are a set of tapes on that that you can buy in our bookshop or videos or DVDs and everything else. Thank you. So here comes Jesus. He's the Word. In flesh. Okay?
Jesus is the word in flesh. Yeah. Just use some imagination. Jesus is the word in flesh. Okay? John says, if you see the Holy Spirit descending, and stay on him, that is the one that God has sealed with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Jesus says himself in John 3, 33, he whom God has sealed has the spirit without measure. He says, and this is he who was baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay? So there's Jesus, the word in flesh. The Holy Spirit comes upon him, and Jesus says twice, he was sealed with the Holy Spirit. So the word, Jesus Christ, in flesh, is sealed with the Holy Spirit. If you see the Holy Spirit descend and stay on him, he's sealed with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Very nice. So what is the seal on Jesus' life as the word? The Holy Spirit that came upon him. When he died, what did he say? Father, in your hands do I commit my spirit. And what did he give up? He gave up. Okay. What did he give up? The Holy Spirit. Okay. Can we put it in those words? What did he break? He gave it up when he died on the cross. Okay. Let's try and read. Let's try and read. It says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. Hmm? Okay. In Revelation, he talks about seven fires, seven eyes, seven lamps, seven lamp stands. Every time, the Spirit. So Jesus has the Spirit without measure, so he's sealed with the fullness of the Spirit. Seven seals. Sevenfold spirit. Isaiah 11. On him shall the spirit of the Lord rest. Spirit of knowledge, spirit of wisdom, spirit of counsel, spirit of might. The sevenfold spirit rests on him, which is the seal of God. Sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof. Now remember Daniel says, all these prophecies against sin, against unrighteousness. All these prophecies that will bring eternal righteousness and will bring salvation. Seal it. And the seals will be broken in the end. So in the end of the world, Christ came. Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. End of which world? The Jewish rituals. The law of Moses. Just stick with me. It's going to get better. If you don't like the doctrine, it's going to get easier in a minute. No man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Jesus says, no man take my life. I got to lay it down myself. This commandment I received of the Father. Because he's talking about a book here. Oh, chapter 1 verse 1 says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if you read something here, it must be Jesus Christ. If he's sealed with the Spirit, it must be Jesus Christ. Because he's the one that God sealed, John 3 and John 6. Thank you. It's not deep. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. One of the elders said unto me, now this is where you're going to get it. Weep not. How long do you know this stuff? There's a set of CDs that you can buy that I preached years ago in our bookshop. This that I'm teaching you now. One of the elders say unto me, weep not. Now see if you get it. Behold, the lion out of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to lose the seals thereof. Verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, slain, 
In other words, crucified Christ. Yeah. Having seven horns. The lamp has in seven horns. Habakkuk chapter 2 says the horns is in his hand, which is the sevenfold spirit of God, which is the hiding place of his power. Seven horns, which is the seven, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. I saw, who can, who can break the seals and open the book? Then in the midst of the throne, I saw a lamb slain. The crucified Christ. This crucified Christ had seven horns, the sevenfold spirit. Seven eyes, the sevenfold spirit. Seven seals, the sevenfold spirit. Three times anointed with a seven, seven, seven. This is my son in who I am well pleased. This is my son, hear ye him. This is my son according to the word of God from the generations of David. Okay? Listen. And he, the lamb, with the seven seals, with the seven eyes, with the seven horns, with the fullness of the immeasurable Spirit of God, he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Okay? But why at the right hand? What's his right hand? Okay, Isaiah 59. God looked and said there was no one to help, no intercessors, Isaiah. He says, and then I decided that my right hand would help me. And I sent the one of my right hand. And he clothed himself with a robe of righteousness. <laughs> you can read it there, Isaiah 59, right? Isaiah 59. Okay, let's read on. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four twenty elders fell before the lamb, having one of them's harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Verse 9. Ewena. They sung, is sung past tense, present tense, future tense. They sung a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. Chapter 6. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were a noise of thunder. Okay. Do you want to go to Matthew 26 and 7? When Christ was hanging on the cross, and first it happened, there was first thunders. Okay. A thunder. And I saw, behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown, and was crown was given him. Okay, Hebrews chapter two says he was crowned with glory. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Colossians two fourteen and fifteen says when he hung on the cross he conquered principalities and powers and made an open display of them publicly. Thank you. It's not much excitement now, but let's read on. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, "Come and see." And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given him. Now let's see if you are, a, just look at me. Isaiah 9 verse 5. Unto us a child is born, son is given, government shall be upon his shoulders. And on the increase of his government and of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And he shall be called, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, Prince of Peace. Okay. Listen. Daniel says, this is how you seal this prophecy. Messiah, comma, Prince shall come. And when he is cut off, it shall be the end of the world. It shall be the end of sin and everlasting righteousness shall enter. Did Daniel say that? Did Isaiah say that? No, let's read on. And he opened the second seal and he said, come and see. And they went out another horse that was red. I wonder if Jesus shed his blood. And he gave him that sat thereon to take peace 
from the earth. Okay, nobody heard it. I'll just read it slowly. And that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. When the lamb took the book, in other words, just, I can't say too much. When the lamb took the book, in other words, when Jesus said, it's time to be crucified. The seals that God has put on me can be broken today. I'm going to give up the Holy Spirit so that Christ can be revealed, so that sinners can be saved. When he took the book, in other words, when he took to pay the price. Just stay with me. There's a whole series on just uh, the, the, the seven seals. But listen tonight to this. He said, and then there was a red horse. And this red horse had power to take peace from the earth. Hmm? Prince of peace. The prince shall be cut off. Peace shall be taken from the earth, says Daniel. Here it comes. Thank you. Okay. He says, and to this red horse was given a sword to take the peace from the earth. Okay. So Genesis 3, 15. I will put enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. He shall you, you bruise his heel. You shall, you know, bruise his head and stuff like that. And he says, uh, verse 24. And a sword was put there to protect the tree of life. Zechariah 13, that we just quoted earlier on, in that day there shall be a fountain open against sin. Drop down a few verses. Four, awake, O sword. Slay the shepherd. Matthew 26, Jesus is breaking the bread. He says, this night my life will be taken away from me. As it is written, awake, O sword, and slay the shepherd. And the Prince of Peace will be cut off. I thought we were going to be with me. So here's Jesus. He said, Father, the hour is come. Give me to break the seals. Hung on the cross, said, let it come. Let them take the sword and take peace away from the earth. Thank you. Scripture must declare scriptures. Not all that stuff that they teach us on those boards that doesn't make sense. That's a lot of monsters. I will not sleep if I listen to those preachers. I mean, if I look at that guy preaching with all those boards, I mean, I, as a grown-up, I can't sleep after I listen to him. What do you do with little children listening to that stuff? No wonder that they don't want to go to church anymore. They just hear about monsters instead of about loving Jesus. When I was small, I heard Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Now today we got to hear because, you know, you're, you're going to fear, man. Because Jesus is going to just break out with all hell on this earth. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Are you preaching a peace future? Yes, God says, I know the thoughts that I have for you. Peace and a prosperous future. Are you preaching that everything's going to come right? Yes, otherwise why are we preaching? Oh, in a few days from now, we're going to see this whole world uh, turning into a bloodbath. Uh, God says, my glory shall fill all the earth. Which side are you on? Are you ready? You see the great sword, the peace of stuff? And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld a black horse, and he that sat on it had a pair of balances in his hand. I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley, which is stuff that you make bread with for a penny, and see that you hurt not the oil and the wine. So I hope somebody's ready now for some kind of sermon. That will maybe break loose in this house tonight. You don't have to hear. You're going to hear in a minute. That is too much. Religious people now shrink. They run away. 
It says, when these seals are being broken, he says, uh, bread will be available for nothing. <laughs> Thank you. I am the bread of life. Take, eat. But watch out that you don't hurt the oil and the wine. Symbols of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 45, Hebrews 1, 9, talking about Jesus Christ, you have anointed him with the oil of gladness. Over and over in Isaiah, Micah, all over, joy is taken from the face of the earth. The wine is not there and the bread is taken away and the oil is not there, okay? Don't hurt the oil and the wine. If you understand what's happening at the cross and Christ is crucified and it's over, Watch out that you do no harm to the oil and the wine. So the oil and the wine here in what we are busy with is bringing the spiritual thing to a very specific context in our life. And this is what we're going to speak on for a few months. Do I have 20 minutes time before 10? You can still go on. Do you remember Jesus preached three days <laughs> to try and bring a portion of what I'm saying tonight? <laughs> Bless Jesus. Mm. So let's go to Romans 7. I don't know how far we can go tonight. Oh, you got your own meeting there in the corner. Somebody offer me some water. Anybody offer me water? Haven't we got water in the house tonight? Nobody hears. Can anybody bring me water? Thank you. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Armas of George Martin. Yeah, thank you. This is holy water. Okay, whoa, you are still with me from where we started? Yes. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, but with stammering lips and tongues will I speak to them. So he says, do you want the Lord or do you want the Spirit? So I took a, a drive through how the Spirit sealed Jesus, how the seal was broken, Jesus gave up the ghost to bring us forgiveness of sins and to bring us righteousness. To bring us to a place where he says, there's things that I want you to have that you shouldn't hurt. And it's the oil and the wine. Okay? So this is what we're going to touch on. I hope it's going to make sense to you tonight in some way. Verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law. By the body of Christ. Okay, what body of Christ? The one that we must discern when we break the bread and drink the cup that he was crucified. Okay? Wherefore, my brethren, you are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Okay, Romans chapter 6 talks about the Christ dying. That's why we wear a crucifix. We, we remember Christ died for us. But he's risen. Of course he's risen. Otherwise, our doctrine is in vain. Hmm? Okay, for those who don't understand. So that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. That's why we remember how his dead body brought us away from the law and brought us the grace of God, forgiveness of sins. But when we come to the resurrection, we are married to him. That we should bring forth fruit unto God. That's why people struggle to bring forth fruit because they believe they're still going to be married to Christ. Thank you for that doctrine that's just been slain. So we just want to have one moment of silence. In the respect of the many years that that doctrine was in the church. 
For one day, when the rapture takes place and for seven years, we'll be married to Christ. No, he says, if Christ died, you're dead to the law. If he's raised, you are married to him to bring forth fruit unto God. Ephesians 5 verse 26, I want to bring you a mystery when we talk about marriage. I'm actually talking about Christ in the church. We are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. We are married to Christ. Paul says, I have betrothed you to one husband. So don't be whoring around with the law. End time preachers. Israel Jewish preachers, don't whore around with the law. Verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the Lord did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Okay, the message is not going to be long as the introduction was. So, Introduction was a bit long. But message. Don't serve in the oldness of the law but serve in the newness of spirit. Okay? Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the law was written in stone. He says, but this old can only kill you. He says, but now we have the ministration of the spirit that brings us life. Are we still there? Second Corinthians chapter 3. The law was written on stone and it kills. The newness of the spirit, Paul says, you are letters of God written in your heart. It says, now something happened to your heart. There it was on stone, but now it's in your heart. This one killed, this one gave you life. This one is law, this one is spirit. This one is old, this one is new. I say it with a purpose. Every word I say carries weight. You'll see it as we go on. Hmm? Let's go to Ezekiel quickly. I wanted to go on, but let's just jump to Ezekiel 11. Is it too much for one night? Of course, it's not enough. It's not, it's not too much. You can go home and read the whole Bible if you want to. How can it be too much? You got the book, you can read pages at night time. Ezekiel 11, Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 36. Hallelujah. Okay. I just read, you just open your heart, say the spirit of understanding, spirit of knowledge and wisdom, spirit of counsel and might is upon me. The eyes of my understanding is open. I will hear the word. I will hear the word. Verse 19. And I will give them one heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. You make your own assumptions. I just read. 18. 18. I'm just reading stuff that I've preached tonight. You just listen with your spirit. <laughs> Verse 31. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed. Make you a new heart and a new spirit. Are you ready? For why will you die? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies, saith the Lord God. So wherefore, turn and live. Amen. Ezekiel 36. I think there's one of the greatest immortality messages. You got it? I'll just jump and let's go to Ezekiel 36. 
Zebra sanabu kushi kiti lama ze hatama. Rebres pavro homoko shiki tibangu seki. 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. You shall keep my judgment and you shall do them. Now you know if I now start on those three scriptures in Ezekiel, we're going to be here another 10 hours and I want to go within half an hour. Newness of spirit, not the oldness of the letter. Not this letter written on stone that kills, but the spirit of God in your heart that brings life. Why do you want to die? Because the power of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. So if the law has been finished, and sin has been finished. For the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Then why do you want to die? God asked, not me. God asked. He says, you can go for the newness of spirit and just leave. I hope you got it in your next magazine, Brother Immortality. I hope you got it. That message, I preached it in two or three of the previous, that scripture for those who do remember. How far should we go? Hurt not the oil and the wine. Mm -hmm. So I just read you a couple of scriptures that I'm going to take the law out of you and I'm going to give you a new spirit on the inside. So serve God in newness of spirit because you are married to Christ. So that you can bring forth fruit unto God. But you can only do it if you are living in the newness of the Spirit. I hope somebody's getting it. Now the oil is the anointing and the wine is the joy. In short. That's why Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 13, it says, And the disciples were filled with the Holy Ghost and with joy. So add the oil and the wine. You struggle with that? Remember in Acts chapter 2, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and started speaking in other tongues. And the people around said, they are full of new wine. Okay? Now you don't say a person is drunk just by... You can't stand on the street and say, there's a drunk person, there's a drunk person. The people that you point to and say they are drunk... There's a definite manifestation. They're loud and noisy. They don't really care what people think of them. They stand on the counter and they sing no matter how false they are. They take out money and they pay for everybody. And they don't care what's going to happen tomorrow. Because at that moment, they got no cares. The wine has taken care of their cares. So Ephesians 5 verse 18 says, Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. I've got the joy, 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 joy deep in my heart. Deep in my heart, deep in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy deep in my heart. Deep in my heart. No wonder nobody comes to your church. They can see you're a liar.
Where are we? We are in Job. Job is a very good book if you want joy. <laughs> people want to take the book of Job and comfort people in their depression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, brother, we've seen what Job has been going through. We're not better than Job if we see her the miseries. Job is so filled with joy. If you read it in the spirit, wow. you freak out on every page. Yeah. <laughs> wow. In 1994, when the joy started hitting our church, without, without, <laughs> without <laughs> knowing about the other revivals. We later heard, but now it's there in Canada, and now it's in America. We had it too. No, but listen, it started off like this. I stood behind the pulpit one night, and I opened the Bible, and I said, Job 8. Yeah, they've not been there. What, what they do now is what happened that night. I said, Job 8. And this is exactly what happened. Everybody started screaming. And I looked at the people. I was so shocked. I said, Job 8. And people fell off their chairs. They crept out of the church. They rolled on the carpet laughing. I said, Job 8. And I couldn't understand. Nobody could open their Bibles. Then I looked at Job 8, and it says, The day when God will turn your misery your mouth will be filled with laughter. And the place of the enemy shall be no more. I said, what? Job 8. He says, yes. Though your beginning was small, your latter end shall greatly increase. Job 8. Hmm? So we know. I don't know how we got here, but we are here. So let's just. Ride the crest of the wave before it hits the ground. <laughs> While we're on the board, let's 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 surf. <laughs> Listen, it says, "What is running on here?" <laughs> hmm? <laughs> Why? Why not? Hmm? We know, we know, you can't go out. We locked all the doors. So if you get to a door, you're going to feel a sucker. There's nobody to take you out. We've locked the doors. And on the other hand, they already saw you on TV. Your friends know you here. They think you're one of us. <laughs> Can't get away now. Camera, just get the whole crowd. Let their friends see them. <laughs> Listen to this. We know that he says, do not get drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We've heard this now. He says, we can't serve in the oldness of the letter, which is a stony thing that kills you. We must serve in newness of spirit. You still are where we are. It's not line upon line precept. Upon <laughs> precept. But it's a stammering lip. So he says, this is the refreshing, and, and this is the rest. But they, <laughs> but they would not listen, you know. You still, oh Lord Jesus, help. You're still with us, okay? You're still in Isaiah 28, Isaiah 29, and you're still in Ezekiel 11, 18, and 36. You are still in Revelation 5 and 6. You are still in Daniel 9 and 12. 
<laughs> You're still there. Okay. You know what we're talking about. So, <laughs> save us, Lord Jesus. Son of David, have mercy. How did we get here? Look at this black suit. Bless you. Oh, Lord. Uh, what are we going to do now, Jesus? I haven't preached the message. Uh, I, I just brought the introduction. Can't stop. Can't stop now. We're still going on. Those watched by TV, we're going on. We're not going off. We haven't brought the message yet. We must go on. Right. So we know for those who are listening, we, we know that <laughs> we know that Jesus said in John 4 and in John 7 that if we are thirsty and we drink, it shall be in us First, a fountain of living water springing up into everlasting life for those who are listening. And chapter, <laughs> chapter 7, verse 37 of John says, River, <laughs> rivers, <laughs> oh Lord Jesus, help us. Rivers of living water shall flow from our innermost being, okay? Then we do know, <laughs> oh Lord. Oh, Lord, just make us all drunk. Why do we worry? Okay. Oh, Lord, I'm getting freaked. freaked. I'm getting drunk. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I'm getting clapped, zapped, everything. Babbity bam. In the Holy Ghost. I want to read, man. I want to read the Bible. <laughs> Fresh oil and new wine. Fresh oil and new wine. Fresh oil. And new wine, fresh oil, <laughs> and new wine. All the depressed looking ones, Jesus loves you. This is not a depression session, it's church. Pity. Listen. We are in Job 32. Huh? We are in Job 32. Help the go. Job 32. I'll just read it. Who said? What's happening? The house is in chaos. But Jesus was in the boat. So don't worry. Job 32, verse 18, for I am full of words, the spirit within me constrains me, my breast is as wine that has no vent, like new wine skins ready to burst, I must speak, so that I must get relief and be refreshed. 
how did we get here? So Isaiah 28, verse 11 and 12 says, With stammering tongues and lips will I speak. And then he said, this is the refreshing. To speak is the refreshing. To speak what? 1 Corinthians 14, to speak in tongues. Fresh oil and new wine. Mark chapter 16, verse 16, go and preach this gospel. And to them that believe it, these signs shall follow. In my name, they shall speak in new tongues. Not just in other tongues, in new tongues. Okay, so if the Spirit comes, if we believe, we can bal gross pardoniva keshe. Job says it's like wine ready to burst out of new wine skins. He says I'm so full of words, I must speak, otherwise I will not be refreshed. So it's in the speaking of the Spirit that we start getting refreshed. So it's time, church, fresh oil and new wine. I don't know. Psalm 92. Ah, it's going to get worse in a minute. Good words. <laughs> he's not from here. He's from the United States. It's a visitor. It's a visitor. Where's the cameras? Capture the moments. You watching, you watching by TV, satellite, internet. It's not my fault. We said to the Holy Spirit, He can take control, so don't blame me, blame the revival. <laughs> oh, Jesus. What's happening to the church? You have capture some of the moments, please. Capture some of the stuff. Get the holy apostles here in the front row. Jag lees noch. We gonna lees noch till half past. You came far, why do you want to leave early? <laughs> Nothing but church. People are trying so hard not to laugh. You know, the Bible says, laugh to do it good like medicine. Don't worry about the makeup you got on, let it crack, man. <laughs> Psalm 92. Everybody say fresh oil and new wine. The B part of verse 10. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. All right. I should be anointed fresh oil. 
It's all right, just go on, I'll preach. It says, I checked up in the Strong's. That word fresh is an unused word. It's not used in the Hebrew vocabulary because they can't really explain it. It means to flourish. It means to be evergreen. It means to be refreshed. It means to be ever fresh. So they can't really explain that word fresh oil. So God wants to anoint you with fresh, flourishing, green, refreshed, ever fresh oil. Jumping to the, to the Greek language, James chapter 3 verse 12, he says something to this effect. I hope I'm right. He says, that's right, I'll preach. He says, the same fountain. Now remember Jesus says, <laughs> Jesus says in John 4, if you drink of the water that I give you, it shall be a fountain of life springing up into everlasting or whatever. Okay, so James, <laughs> remember Job 32 says, I'm full of words. The spirit within me constrains me. It's like new wine that want to burst out. So James chapter 3 says, if you want to be perfect, you've got to have your words in control. And verse 12 says, the same fountain, the same fountain. Cannot, cannot bring forth, for those who are still listening, I'm still listening, for those, the same fountain, cannot bring forth, bitter and fresh water. So that word fresh is an un interpreted unused word again this time in the Greek language so the que the best they can get to it is like sweet new fresh so when you speak let it be new let it be fresh let it be awesome okay thank you for those who are still listening I'm still listening uh, What did we want to do now, Lord? I can't remember. Somebody still in the house? Two. Fresh oil? A new one. I, I don't care if I don't say too much. I mean, the message was fresh oil and new wine. So if God jumps in, it's like Peter preaching in Acts chapter 10. While Peter was yet speaking, the Holy Ghost fell on them all. And while Quibbers tried to explain fresh oil and new wine, they were all already full of fresh oil and new wine. For those who still want to read Numbers 11. I got to do this. I just got to do it. Now remember in John, John chapter 6 where it says, God has sealed him. You still know where we are, are you? <laughs> God has sealed him with the Holy Spirit. Remember John 6 verse 27 for those who are still here. I mean Numbers 11. But I'm trying to explain how we get to Numbers 11. I'm trying to explain. Are you Okay. He's shaking like a reed in the wind. The wind bloweth where it listeth. You do not know where it's coming from and where it's going to. Okay, I sound like a real reverend. Holy priest. Are you making it? Okay, listen. Remember when we talked about the seals, and we, you know, talking about Jesus being sealed with the Holy Spirit, 
we, we quoted from John chapter 6 where Jesus said, you know, where they said Moses gave us manna and Jesus said, no, I am the true bread and your father gives you. Remember the story? And then he says, uh, because God has sealed him. I hope it makes sense. Forgive me if he doesn't listen to the tape. So the whole thing with the manna happened in Numbers 11. So let's read Numbers 11. And the manna was the coriander seed, and the color thereof was like bedwellum. The was hill bedwellum there was, okay. And the people went about, just for the Afrikaners, and they gathered the manna and ground it in mills or beat it in a mortar. Numbers 11, 8. They baked it in pans. They made cakes of it for anybody who listens. And the taste was like the taste of fresh oil. Huh? I'm there. You can't believe it, we nearly finished. Numbers 11 says, when they ate the manna, it tasted like fresh oil. I checked it out in the Strong's Concordance again. That's another word that is totally unused in the Hebrew language, so they can't really explain it. And this is the closest that they describe it in the dictionary that works with the Strong's Concordance. It says, they could not describe the taste of, of the fatness in it. It was so fresh. That's why God said you've got to pick it up every day. Okay, nobody hears, but I'm trying my best. Liebe Jesus, sagen dir, sie noch mal ich kein Kinder. Leer mir und tut ich bitte nie mein Leben ein bisschen. Hmm? What? Do you know where we are? Fresh oil, new wine. And now I'm full of it. But we're going to get to it. No, no, hell. I'm so full of words, I want to burst this joke. It's like new wine. So, Psalm 92, you have anointed me with fresh oil. So, Numbers 11, when they ate the manna, referring to the bread, it tasted like fresh oil. So not one of those words is used in the Bible, actually. It's unused words, and they try to describe it by, it's so fresh, it's so oily, it's so anointed, it's so powerful, okay? Somebody will get it as we go on. If, if you want to buy a car, in the days and age we're living in, you want to know, has this car got a full service history? Like a couple of years ago, you didn't want to buy a car if it had a lot of mileages on. Nowadays, some cars have 200 and 300,000 kilometers on, and the guys say, it's right, it's got a full service history. It's got everything to do with it. It means, Every 15 to 20,000 kilometers, this car's oil have been changed. So as long as you keep on changing the oil, as the piston goes up the sleeve, 
in a car and it turns around and the camshaft and the crankshaft turns and the conrods, everything is working. There's always particles of iron coming off and it makes the oil dirty, makes it to start working like a grinding paste and it wastes up the engine. So at the end, the oil works like sandpaper instead oil. The dirtier it gets, the more it wears off the engine. So if you keep on changing the oil, you're always getting rid of the dirt. So instead of trying to keep your life clean, stay drunk in the spirit. Get anointed with fresh oil. Come in every service for an oil change. And you will not be dirty on Monday. And you will not be dirty on Tuesday. Hmm. Do you getting the message? I hope somebody will get it sometime. He's getting himself by him. Where's my Bible? Let's close. Joel chapter 2 and Zechariah chapter 9. Joel 2 and Zechariah. You of course know I missed the message somewhere, but we're still in the fresh oil. I haven't missed the message. Forgive me, I haven't. We're still on track. I will not give that negative thing a chance. No, no. We're still in the fresh oil. Tony, fresh oil, new wine. 